Good evening, everyone. I'm Kamala Gunawardena. Uh, I think you all, we all know each other now. A lot of people in the participants, I, I think we all know, but as a formality, I'm, I'm highway consultant and a fellow representative of the ISL Council this session. Uh, today's proceedings uh, also uh, lecture is done by our Professor Jai Singh, Senior Professor of Civil Engineering Sectional Committee, Civil Engineering uh, Department of the University of Moratua. So we don't have to go for big introduction because he has been doing about nine to 20 lectures for this session. So uh, actually today's title is a very valuable one, Value Engineering for Highway Bridges and Flyovers. Actually he is, I think uh, according to his uh, abstract, he's going to elaborate mainly the use of high strength concrete needs a great knowledge on concrete technology and site practices. And since so many different aspects are needed, uh, needs a great knowledge on concrete technology with these high quality cost-effective structures and that will also he will discuss today. So out of main items, the technology greater strengths up to like 80, megapascals with site mix concrete will be illustrated since such optimization is highly pertinent to today's context. Recording in progress. High fuel prices and supply chain associated steep escalations. So with this remark, I wish to say that we are much fortunate that to share more fruitful lectures, programs from Prof. Jai Singer expertise areas during this session and on on the on his tenure as the chairman of the civil engineering sectional committee of the ISL. Without further ado, I invite Professor Jai Singer to take over. Over to you, Professor. Actually, yeah, uh, can, the, can the host allow this, me yes. to share the screen? Can the host allow me to share the screen, please? Yeah. And uh, I, I request all the participants to mute your mics throughout the session unless you have to ask the questions. Thank you. Enjoy this photo okay. lecture. Can the, can the host allow me to share the screen? Why you can't? Mm, it does not allow me to open the video. Oh, now it's okay. Now it's okay. Mm. Right. So first, uh, I'll give a brief interruption. And uh, so first, uh, I'll do a small comparative study. Uh, you know, I'll give a uh, two examples, and then show you why we need value engineering. So if you take, uh, let's say four lane highway, what, we, what, what do we have? First we have 1.5 meter uh, walkway. Then we need uh, two, two lanes of 3.5 meter. Then we need another center median 1.2 meter. Then we need 3.5 meter another 3.5 meter and another 1.5 meter. So this is the width. So if you add them up, here you get seven meters. Here you get another seven meters. So seven, 14, 17, seven, four, uh, 14, 17, 18.2 meters. This width is 18.2 meters. So if you have a width of 18.2 meters, so you have to see how we get the get this uh, traditional. Traditionally, what we do is we make 
a bridge like this and then we will place i girders at a space if the span is about 30 meters uh, or even 32 34 in that range we go for i mean i girders and we can generally go up to about uh, 35 even 40 meters but uh, you have to be mindful about the weight of the structure the weight of the structure is a very important parameter right uh, engineer kamala i hope you can hear me properly yeah yeah right okay no i'm just checking right okay so basically what we do is Generally, we keep about 1.5 meters here, another 1.5 meters there. And then what we do is we actually uh, create a slab at the top level. And this slab will be about uh, two, 220 to 250 millimeters thick. And uh, because uh, we need some stiffness, it's very, it's always we provide two mats of reinforcement. Two mats of reinforcement. Right? So, top mat and the bottom mat. And we have to be very mindful about the, the, the behavior this way. So, it's likely that we might get 16 millimeter, H16, at 150 central center. Very, very likely. In the other direction, in the longitudinal direction, we might get H12 at 150 centimeters. So if you do the calculations, you will generally find <coughs> for crack controlling, we need this type of reinforcement. On the other hand, uh, it's a, there's a possibility for going for some little bit of pre-stressing, like uh, you put a pre-stressing tendon here, and then pre-stress this way, and we go for about 1.0 newtons per millimeter square pre-stress. That is also okay. <coughs> 1 to 1.5 newtons per millimeter square. Uh, like transverse pre-stress also can be used. Uh, that is one of the options available for you, but they, this will be axial pre-stress. And uh, then on top of that, you will get the very coarse uh, the wearing costs will be there, and then there will be handrails. So the road furniture will be there. So basically, somewhere in the middle, you'll get the handrail and some curbs. So here also you'll get curbs. All those things will be there. So when you are designing, uh, now because you are having a wide, uh, so this is the pipe foundation. So this is a cab. Uh, capping, sorry, uh, the pile foundation, the pile cap, and on top of pile cap, we actually start this pier, and the width of the pier, or the thickness of the pier, can be about one meter to one point two meter. So the pier size can be one point zero to one point two meter, and uh, that will all depend on what you are going to do. So sometimes we go for this type of thing when, when, when you look at the section, you see that, you know, we have uh, one meter here. And here we have gone for about two meters. The idea is, you know, you need space for keeping the beams and, uh, you know, making some kind of connection here. So you need space and you need a space for keeping the bearings as well. So there will be bearings. So there are so many different factors. And uh, in the early days, uh, people were very worried about many things. One is thermal packing. Number one. Number two, shrinkage. Creep. Use of PT. How to use pre-stress comp? PT. PT beams. So this will be PT beams, pre-stress concrete beams. And they can be, uh, you know, expansion joints. 
the, the moment you go for expansion, you get the next problem. What is that? Waterproofing. And then in core countries, you have to worry about DIC salts. Because they are salt. So you have to worry about DIC salt. But in Sri Lanka, we don't, fortunately, we don't have that problem. And then uh, you will have another question, simply supported. Or continuous. Then uh, the foundation. You can have a rough foundation or a pile foundation. So one of those. Now you can see on, on one half sheet, I have shown you the kind of variable. So, so another variable can be the beams. Beams can be large number of I beams or few box girders. So many variables. So here, when you look at all these variables, you can see, when you look at all these variables, you can clearly see, we can have so many different solutions. And that's where the value engineering comes in. So when you have so many variables, what happens? The a brilliant bridge engineer What will he do? He'll optimize. Average engineer will have so many questions. What are they? 30 megapascal for substructure. Then he might say, I will use 30 megapascals for deck. And they can uh, beams both form the superstructure, and we might say 40 megapascal for PT beams. And this is also 30 megapascal. Then you have foundations. You might say, I'll use 25 megapascal for pile foundation. And when it comes to the pile foundation, we have another question. What are we going to do with piles? There can be many options. One is precast. The next option, raft. Third option, board, piles, in situ cast. So in the board pile also, you can have so many different options. What are they? One thing is, you know, you can have the pile going with reinforcement to the bottom. And you might even ask, can we have pieces? PT in the pile. Can I have PT in the pile? Or you might even ask, can we have a piled raft? Now we can see, when you start with the bridge, we have the lowest foundation. Then we have the substructure. Then you have the superstructure. So all these can have so many variables. We have raft, piles, and piles can have precast, board, in situ cast, and board in situ cast, 
we can have PT, reinforced, or reinforcement only at the top, 12 meters. So many different variations just in the foundation itself. Then we also, we have to think about the, as a substructure, uh, if you want, you can say pile cap is sub foundation or sub, sub pile cap is what is in between substructure and foundation. So if you want, you can put the pile cap to the substructure or you can put it to the foundation. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter, but generally it goes with the foundation because foundation will be completed only when the pile cap is cast. So it's better to go with the pile cap. Then we have, we have peers. Again, we can ask. On top of peer, you can have peer cap in B. And here you can say whether it's PT or reinforced concrete. Peers also can be PT peers or reinforced concrete. Peers. Again, so many different options. Superstructure can be reinforced concrete, PT slabs, PT beams, and you can also have more options. PT, transverse PT, PT deck, or reinforced concrete deck. So many different things to decide. So we have to first see where we stand in street. And we all know today is uh, seventh. So we can have so many different solutions. So what are those solutions? Before finding the solution, we are trying to identify the problem. What is the problem? Problem is very straightforward, concrete. We have cement. Bag is about 3,000 rupees. So that is one problem because it used to be around 1,000 rupees three months ago. So if you have accepted a contract three months ago, now we are finished because cost, cost of concrete has gone up. Cost of cement alone has increased by 300%. A huge problem. Then we have 20 millimeter aggregates. What is the cost? Maybe about 15,000 rupees a cube and used to be about 10, eight to 10,000 rupees. Why? The diesel prices have gone up so much. Now, one cube of, we really don't know the exact price because uh, not much construction is going on, but I'm sure with all the difficulties there, the lorry drivers will say, the suppliers will say 15,000 rupees because the, the lorry drivers will say, we cannot come for anything less than uh, how, my, how much, I mean, they have to spend about uh, the diesel going around 500 rupees a liter. They have to, uh, the cost of running the lorry for one kilometer will be about uh, 200 rupees. When you consider all the cost of, uh, First, like salaries of the lorry drivers, uh, uh, tire wastage, the leasing that you have to pay. When you consider all the costs, the cost of running a lorry for 200, uh, one kilometer will be 200 rupees. So if it is uh, 20 kilometers, uh, you, you buy it from Aturugiri or all those areas where you get, uh, you know, quarries. So uh, when you buy, a, buy from a quarry and uh, it is about uh, 20 kilometers to come to your site. And uh, so there alone it's 4,000 rupees. But, uh, but if it is a bigger lorry, uh, it can be even uh, around 300 rupees uh, 
uh, it's a huge uh, three cube lorry. The cost can be around 300 kilometers because they are very having very powerful engines. So they might do only about three kilometers per liter, especially in the traffic conditions. So, so they might be charging something like 250 rupees per kilometer. So uh, when you have 20 kilometers, they are on 5,000 rupees, but they have to charge for going back as well. So, so when you consider all those charges, so going back also you have to charge, so the transport cost will double. Then you will find that, you know, cube is that. Then it comes to sand. Now, bigger sand from Mayangan is no longer possible. Why? Because uh, it's far away. Just one moment, I'll set up the uh, mobile hotspot. Right, okay. Uh, Virginia Kamala, can you see? Uh, yeah, professor. Can you see the see this? Uh, can uh, see, thing? but it's uh, yeah. Can see. Little bird, little bird. Is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Just one more. I'll bring a lamp and then make it little, little light. The lights are a little dim today. Uh, I think we have to proceed, no? Fine. Now it's better, Professor. How about now? Yeah, it's better. Oh, better. Yeah, yeah. One problem, we don't have sunlight these days. So because of that, uh, we can't charge the batteries with solar. Right. So, uh, so we have huge problems. So you can see it has nearly doubled in the price. Sand may be about 25 to 30,000 a cube, which means we can not no longer use uh, uh, river sand. We have to go for manufactured sand. We have to go for manufactured sand, right? So even the manufactured sand might cost about 50,000 rupees. Used to be about 7,500. Then admixture. Used to be about 400 rupees. Now 800 to 1000 rupees a liter. Right. So, so first we look at a reasonable uh, concrete mix like water mega pesca to understand the problem. So you can see there's a huge problem. And I don't have to tell you about the reinforcement used to be about 125,000 a ton. Now it's about uh, 700,000 rupees a ton. We don't know whether it has gone up even more, even further. And we all know it's because 
of USA, not because of Russia. So this is the country, you know, with mad people who go and create trouble somewhere. Then two countries fight, and that creates a huge mess in the world. And uh, people of USA, UK, Japan, to a lesser extent, and uh, Australia, they all suffer. The countries that suffer most are what? USA and Australia. Why? They rely on private cars. And Japan, UK, they rely more on bicycles. And Japanese people, they rely a lot on trains and walking. All these countries walking is not a problem. So they walk a lot. They do cycles, they use trains. But the most affected countries are Australia and U uh, USA because they use cars. And there's a, another country that is very much affected. And that is Sri Lanka. Because we use more oil than more some of these countries. Because so even to walk, half a kilometer, what do you use? We use a three-wheeler or a car. And we, nev we never think of using a bicycle. So Sri Lanka is another country that is suffering a lot. Not because we don't have dollars, but we don't know how to use the dollars of it. So Sri Lanka is in one country that we have got everything messed up because we have not adopted the correct policies. So if you look at the correct policies for a country, correct policies, we need expressways. In this context, we are okay. We need highways. That means A and B class roads. Here also we are okay. We need red trunks. What are red trunks? They are the small roads that will interconnect all these other roads. So any road that connects, uh, any small road of uh, three meter width, three meter or wider, is a rat trap. So, so three to six meter road that connects two other two other roads is a rat trap. It can be a local road, but it's a rat trap. Why? Any local road can attract local traffic. Now these days, you know, because of Google, they attract uh, long distance traffic as well. But generally in Sri Lankan context, long distance drivers don't like these Google based traffic uh, uh, guidelines because sometimes, you know, they take you in a roads that are very narrow, that are not just to save time, they take you in the wrong roads. So because of that, many drivers don't like, uh, long distance drivers don't like the Google guidance. So basically, uh, we are okay. Then you have to see what is not okay, not satisfactory. Because if you understand the problem, only we can find the solutions. Because most of the time, we try to find the solutions without understanding the problem, and then you find the solution is not up to the mark. So. So we, I'm trying to tell you about the problem first. Then, then we'll understand how to solve it. So I have told you half the story. That is, you know, we are having a huge problem with concrete, huge problem with steel reinforcement, huge problem with uh, shuttering. The shuttering private costs are very high. So, so unless you go for steel shuttering, then uh, you know you are, not, you are and even steel shuttering is also very expensive because steel is very expensive. So we are having a big problem. Right? But not satisfactory. We have one million three wheelers. We have four million scooters, motorcycles. 
we have 1 million cars and we also have 1 million diesel vehicles. Now to this lot and I think now we are getting uh, many bicycles as well. We really don't know the number. We really don't know the number. But I'm sure that, you know, we are getting many bicycles. Because uh, we have about uh, uh, 6 million houses. And I'm sure, you know, now we'll be getting many cycles, at least one bicycle in every house. But if you look at uh, a country like uh, Holland, which is uh, very much into the cycles, bicycles. So the number of bicycles is about two times the population. So I cannot remember the exact population, but you know, it's, it's more than the population. So the number of bikes available in that country is more than the population. And our number may be, I'm sure it's the less than the population. Then if you want to see uh, how Cuba faced this uh, problem in 1990 when uh, Russia, under the leadership of uh, President Gorbachev, uh, you know, allowed Russia to break up. Uh, maybe another America initiated, uh, American initiative, we really don't know. Whatever it is, you know, all the countries that were under the Russian control were allowed to be free, including uh, East Germany. So in the world map, this America and Cuba is here, Russia is here, India is here, and uh, Africa is here, and then you get the Europe here. So Russians could not control so what happened was, uh, Russians used to send a lot of oil to this country, Cuba. And Cuba was at the, at the very uh, doorstep of America. So Russia liked to maintain Cuba, but Gorbachev was also different. He was not interested in that type of oil. He wanted to, uh, you know, make things easier and to end the Cold War. So Russia made smaller, was became smaller, and they could not get oil from Cuba. So Fidel Castro, Fidel Castro was a wise man. He imported, Cuba has a small population. He, he imported 3 million bicycles from China. And uh, you know, China and both uh, China and Russia, China's here, uh, Russia, they are both communist countries, but China has Chinese communism, and Russians have Russian communism. So, although they, both countries talk about communism, they are very different. So, Russians don't like Chinese communism, and Chinese don't like Russian communism, but now, now they are becoming more and more friendly. So these two countries are becoming friendly. And uh, so Europe is there. Europe is more USA based now. So these are the things that we have to understand. So basically they, they imported 3 million bicycles from China because uh, China were willing to help these people. And uh, what they did was, you are, your house is here, your factory is here, then they said, okay, you don't you can go to the factory here. So you travel only this, you don't travel all this distance. So they allow people to change the workplaces so that you work very close to your home. And that way, nobody in Cuba felt any problem. And uh, very few vehicles on few vehicles on uh, roads. So roads become safe for cyclists. Safe for cyclists. And also people became healthier. 
because you know there's something called body mass index which is weight divided by height say 1.7 square so you calculate it and this must be between 18 to 20 25 you are okay if it is more than 25 you are not okay if i ask many in the audience what is your body mass index and I, if i ask you to calculate it i'm sure for sri lankans who eat lot of rice generally the body mass index is between 25 to 30 which is a slightly risky range and the risk increases as you age as you reach 50 and above and today i was told that you know one road development authority engineer died uh, while waiting in the uh, petrol queue he was 55 years of age and he died of a heart attack now you will ask why the reason is you know you you have, you have, you have not maintained your body mass index between 30 and if it is greater than 30 then you are high risk high risk group so calculate it and see then you will ask how do you bring it within the within the range and the, it is easy you get up at four o'clock or five o'clock by 5 30 to 6 you go out four kilometer walk with empty stomach and why i ask you to get up early in the morning is you know if you get up early in the morning and do some useful work even office work or whatever because most of you are working from home if you do some office work at this time you'll find your, your work is super efficient so it's because a lot of people are working from home we can if you want to make the maximum out of your working hours for your office get up around four four five o'clock in the morning and then work one hour two hours for your do your office work there you'll find your brain works like hell so you go walk four kilometers and then then you get into a cycle and cycle 30 minutes and or else if you are interested in yoga exercises try yoga for 45 to one hour 60 minutes so this is the first part walking the second part it can be either cycling or yoga both will help you to improve your uh, blood circulation the bone mass bone weight the strength of the bones the strength of the muscles everything will be improved and you will become slim and gradually you can start reaching from 35 to 30 plus to 30 and then you can increase from 30 reduce from 30 to 25 range and if you are in the range of 23 to 24 as a male or 22 to 23 as a female then you are okay pretty okay and then uh, so what you do is after that uh, go for a light meal because in sri lanka we used to have only one major meal and what happened was uh, in 1940s uh, after the second world war i mean we started getting uh, free rice and uh, we imported we, we exported tea and we imported a lot of rice and our people gradually started to eat three meals breakfast lunch and dinner and the maximum calorie intake should be 2000 whereas our people used to eat 2500 to 3000 as the calorie intake and because of that we developed people who look like with a fat belly and you can see you can look at chinese you can look at japanese you can look at many people from uk but americans are very different they they because they, they eat too much they have a problem but many people from UK, Japan, uh, Australians also eat too much. But many people who are doing pretty, or Germans, 
Germans, many Germans are doing well, but some others are not doing well. So basically, if you consume anything more than 2000 calories, you ask you for trouble. And you can see our uh, rice intake in Sri Lanka is 107 kilograms average per person. And we should actually bring it down to about 60 to 80. The moment, the day that we do that, we will not have any. Uh, most of the health problems can be very easily solved the moment you bring down the body mass index. Now we will ask why it is relevant. Because it's very relevant because for you to do value engineering, what do you need? You need a super powerful brain. Super brain. Because there are so many parameters to look for. Unless you have a super brain, you cannot figure out how each parameter is related to another. So because of that, you need a super brain. You get a super brain. All the Sri Lankans are having a wonderful brain. They are very intelligent. But your brain power can be used only if your stomach is empty. Stress empty. If your stomach is empty or just filled with little food, then your brain can become super, super brain because we have so many parameters to look for. So what is the, what is the easy way out taken by our engineers? They simply copy from earlier designs. Earlier designs. And this, is, this happens all the time. And if you have one mistake, then it will be repeated in all the subsequent designs. And one good example is STDP project. That was uh, planned in 1990s, late 1990s, under the President Chandrika Bandana Kumar the government. Then it was the project, the ADB approved the project in uh, 2003, and then the Prime Minister was Ranil Vikramasi. And then CCB was involved in the designs. I'm trying to show you how we can get things wrong, unless you are very vigilant. So the CCB is mainly a building engineering, so they are good in buildings. So they did not have enough expertise in bridges, but the engineers thought, okay, I'm a good building engineer. I can be a bridge engineer. It's very wrong. Why? Bridges conditions are very different and our thinking is very different. That is what you have to get right. So they thought we can have piles. And then there was another guy called engineer Chan, a Malaysian born Indian. And he, he also did not have much experience, but he pretended he knows the subject. Now, this is the whole biggest problem. If you don't know, say don't know. Never say I know when you don't know. So they put battered piles. Battered piles. And use of battered piles is very wrong. Why? Not for static. Static forces, battered piles are okay, but dynamic. When if you if you get earthquakes, dynamic forces, battered fires fail. The moment the battered fire that is used for stability fails, what will happen to the bridge? The foundation will start moving this way. And the, because the foundation is moving, what will happen? Now the foundation is moving, bridge can collapse. So the bridges with battered piles collapse in an earthquake. And we have built an expressway lasting 120 years at least. We actually expect it to last 200, 300 years, but at least 120 years. Because even if all of our cars to go to Mathura, we need an expressway. So we have designed expressway with the wrong concept. What is the correct concept? I don't know who developed this concept. Correct concept is board piles board piles, the correct concept. And then this 
precast spice is wrong again. Why? Because these can be in reverse. Reverse, we get scour. Scour, scouring. Remove all of this material. And if the bridge is not anchored to the bedrock, what will happen? The bridge can be washed away. Just imagine washing away of a big bridge in the major highway like Southern Highway, which crosses, which has Ginganga crossing, which has Kaluganga crossing. All these crossings, the bridges are on mostly on precast by some. Some may be having board pies, but most of the bridges are on precast. Pies. I mean, I have checked some of the bridges when uh, the major problem occurred. And now let's look at the major problem. Now again, that's another blunder. So when you look at the, when you learn the blunders, then, then it's easier to come up with a good value yield solution. Otherwise you might come up with a cheap solution, but it may have a lot of blunders, which is wrong. So major problems. Now what, what is one of the biggest problems with big pile caps? If this is about 1.5 meters deep, what is the problem? DEF, that is delayed entering guide formation. Delayed entering guide formation. What will happen? If you have delayed entering guide formation, means in the center part of this, temperature goes above 70 degrees, then what will happen? The reaction of C3A, tricalcium aluminate plus H2O, will form a chemical substance which is stable. But if the temperature has to be less than 70 degrees for this to be stable, and this is the one that gives strength from one hour to 24 hours, and it is responsible for about 10% of strength. Because you get only about 8% uh, C3A. So this can give about 10% of the strength of concrete. And once form is stable, if the temperature is less than 70. So here what happens is, if you don't control the temperature, in the core area, temperature can rise above 70 degrees. So what happens? Then the reaction goes in the other direction. Now the reaction that went this way initially, now will reverse. So now the material is this one. And if you do not provide a lot of reinforcement in the pile cap, what will happen is pile will develop minor cracks. And through these minor cracks, water will come here. And as the water comes, what will happen? Now this reaction will again start, <laughs> but this reaction in the first 24 hours is very much okay because concrete is weak and it's sinking due to the evaporation of water. And C3A plus H2O has a higher volume than C3A. So what happens is in weak concrete it's sinking and this is this will expand. So shrinkage plus expansion, not bad. And the concrete can accommodate it because, because concrete is still weak. It has no strength. So all these movements can be very well accommodated by concrete. So concrete you will find, though it shrinks, you cannot see the shrinkage very much. So you will look like it looks like the concrete is there intact. But what actually what happens is it has shrink, shrinkage has occurred, so has the expansion. So what will happen? Now this guy is expanding and is exerting pressure in every direction. And unless you have a lot of reinforcement, unless you have a lot of reinforcement, what will happen? These facts, these stay, this expansion. The force of expansion is sufficient to crack it like hell. And it will crack, 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 crack. Unbelievable cracking. 
so most of the bridges uh, so if i tell you about uh, southern uh, highway uh, so this is what happened in the highway so because it's so important for us to know the history and when you know the history you will not make mistakes when you don't know the history you make mistakes and then somebody will say oh you are a fool because this you should know this as a, as an as an experienced engineer you should know what happened in the past so what happened is uh, this is uh, sri lanka and uh, this cot tower this goal this mark this is matter so we do have no no intention of doing it for matter initially but we we planned this one about 10 kilometers in inwards inland then you will ask why because those days philosophy was no house damage so select paddy fields so the instruction given was select paddy fields and run the highway across paddy fields and have links to the highway from many places so that every interchange will have a link to the major town so we have link to uh, panadura we have link to colombo at kotta panadura kasbaba uh, so that is uh, uh, the kasbaba uh, intake uh, sorry in, uh, exchange at kahatudua at kahatudua and then panadura is at uh, galanigam and then we have uh, kaluthara at uh, dorang dorangoda then we have uh, matugama sorry matugama at uh, matugama kaluthara at dorangoda then we have uh, alugama at uh, valipanna then we have ambalangoda at uh, kurundaga hatanne and after that we have hikkadu at hikkadu badegama and we have gol at pinnadu so those are the only exchanges and after that we have about three more one at valigama and two other cities so we have up to mathara godagama we have exchange and then we have another uh, about uh, five or six uh, when we go up to mathara so so you can see it's a it's a very well planned highway and uh, we have connections to all these and the concept of central highway was very different because people started shouting and they said we want our highway going through our city so it goes through mirigama it it goes from kadavatha mirigama and to kurunagar it goes to town whereas the concept of first highway stdp southern highway was very different and it never went through the towns it went away from the cities and the basically the the structures were all in uh, it has across every river that goes so ginganga uh, so there are so many other rivers so all those rivers means lot of bridges and then because it was on a low lying area so it it was on a embankment so it was like this but when you have when you have an embankment for the highway you have to make sure people can cross from one side to the other so we were going to cross from one side to the other so we have people crossing and the vehicles also crossing so which means you need lot of culverts so they the initial team decided okay we are going to have a strange structure that means uh, like a 6 to 8 mm thick steel and it's a corrugated steel like this it's a corrugated steel. so it's like it's a corrugated steel going this way so there are corrugations like that so this corrugation is uh, like this going like that corrugated and then you the compact soil gradually compact soil gradually and then you, the structure can be easily constructed but these are not meant for so express so so when the so all our highways are undertaken by ministry of highways ministry of highways the expressways are constructed by highways ministry of highways because uh, they, they are constructed by 
international contractors. So Ministry of Highways handle, but for management, they get engineers from RD. So RDA from the ministry will ask for many engineers, senior engineers, and senior engineers from RDA will become the, the people who are actually managing the project because uh, the administrative officers of uh, uh, our ministry cannot manage the project. So, so they don't know how to manage the project of this scale. So, uh, so page number one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, five, six, five, six, seven, eight. So this page number nine. Page number nine, seven, seven, two thousand twenty. So, so basically, uh, this was sent to RDA design office for PIN. And then uh, there was one tough engineer called Engineer Nimal Chansiri. He didn't know, know anything about this type of structures because they actually came from the design engineers, but he's a guy who, who never gives up. He, he, he's, a, he's one of the brilliant engineers we ever had. And he went through the literature. Collateral literature, and he found that these are not meant for express space. These are actually meant for uh, some uh, not so important roles. So he protested. And after that, these uh, were never sent to him. So he was out. So he was, he was not sent. So his comments are not taken. So this was in 1999. 1998 or 1997, so that's a long time. Then in uh, 2003, they started constructing this one. And because of the inexperience of uh, CCB engineers, they never bothered of DEF. So that is one mistake. So you have to be very careful because when you go for value engineering solutions, you also can do these blunders. When you do, when if you don't know, what can go wrong? Because in value engineering, we are actually trying to do things differently. So if you are trying to do things differently, then you must know how things can go wrong. Otherwise, you will do blunders. And then, no value engineering, because now to correct the blunders, you might need to spend more money than you ever saved. Right? So, so you have to be very careful. So they went for this. Uh, they found that... Uh, uh, so they... They did not bother. So the so because these uh, pies now you know when you have pie cap, say this is the wall one meter wide. So all these loads that are coming through this will go through this way, this way, and this will be going to tension. This is going to tension. So what we do is we we calculate this tension and then provide reinforcement like this. And then uh, we also look for the minimum reinforcement based on the full height, minimum reinforcement, 0.13%. Minimum reinforcement is also going. Because we know things can go wrong in a pie cap, especially when it is thick. Because we might not control the DEF very well, but uh, generally when you provide a lot of reinforcement, this problem will not occur. Now, due to the inexperience of the CC, CCB engineers who got all these battered piles and all those things, wrong concepts. We had a lot of piles, precast piles. So when you have a lot of precast piles, when the load is coming from above, then you'll find, you know, the load can go in every direction. And the effect of uh, load transfer is not very pronounced because we have so many piles, so the reinforcement can be reduced. So they use some unknown theory. Actually, I tried to understand. I could not understand. So it's an unknown theory. Unknown theory. And they, they actually reduce the reinforcement to such an extent. Even the subsequent reports, all the consultants said, consultants said, pile caps are very lightly 
are very like the, all these reports are available in RDA. Uh, so perhaps are very lightly read. I also had all these reports because, uh, so I'll tell the story now. So when this was planned, like this, from here to here, Kurunuga Hatabme, it's a four lane highway. And Kurunuga Hatabme to Matara, two lane. So this portion was given to ADB, was funded by ADB, and the contract was Kumaga. Kumagai was the contract. Kumagai Gumi. And uh, the concern was Routon and uh, another Wilbur Smith or something, some company was there, but uh, uh, you know, they, 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 were, they were later blacklisted because uh, later ADB found that they, that particular company has taken a bribe from or given a bribe or taken a bribe or something from in another in another contract in another country. So the moment ADB found that you know some uh, corruption was involved, they blacklisted that company and later only router was there. Only router was there. Uh, that is called Wilbur Smith or something. I can't remember the exact name. So they were blacklisted and if you go to internet, you can actually find uh, who was there and who was blacklisted and what is the reason. So if you type uh, 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 the black uh, Blacklisting of Wilbur Smith, uh, you can get all the details on the uh, internet, right? So what happened was, uh, so that is, and then this section was funded by JICA, and they got two, 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 two companies. One is Taisei, and you know Taisei is very, very well known these days because uh, because one minister has asked for a buy bribe from Taisei. Taisei is a is a good Japanese company, and then. Uh, then the next part was China. China was from uh, Dorangar to Urunduga Hatam was by China Harbor. Kota to <coughs> Dorangar was from, that is Kadutara Exchange, was by Taish. And it was all funded by Jaika. And you'll ask how I know all these details. One thing is all, most of these details are available on the internet. But anyway, uh, some incident happened in October 2009. So actually, uh, this project started in 2003. It went well 2000, until about 2006. Then things started to get, uh, you know, then uh, they changed the project. So, so this was from Kottawa. Here you get Kurudu uh, Kurundu. And then here you get uh, gold, here you get Martha. So uh, Kumagai was the first company started and they did the two lane project very well up to Martha. By around 2006, 2007, the project was almost there. Then uh, the, the suddenly the wisdom came. They thought, okay, why are we constructing a two lane highway two-lane highway with a shoulder, with a hard shoulder. So it was like a highway like this, the hard shoulder, this is the highway, this is the highway, this is the hard shoulder. Why not make it a little wider? Why not make it small area, lane, lane, center median, lane, lane, and small thing. So you need only to widen it by only six meters. So when you widen it by six meters, now you can make convert the two lane with hard shoulder to four lane. So you need to extend it only by six meters or eight meters. Then they found, oh, why, why are we doing such a blunder? Because uh, having a two lane uh, highway is a blunder. You can easily convert it to four lane so these people, Kumagai was said, okay, you don't have to worry about Gol Mathara, you forget about that area. Now you make it four lane. So Kumagai started making it two lane, four lane. And by uh, 2008, the war was going on at full swing and 
you know, we were getting very bad reports about STD people. With a lot of corruption, theft, a lot of bad reports are there. In, from time to time, we used to hear a lot of bad reports about that. And we, were, we, we heard that, you know, it's, it's not properly managed by the, the, the ministry team, uh, who is actually the engineers from RB and so on. A lot of problems were there. And then uh, we use also heard that, you know, buses of private buses, private buses of uh, Matugam LPT area, they all run on uh, diesel, diesel, uh, uh, you know, taken out from uh, various machinery and all that. So there's so many bad stories about that. And in 2009, October, When, uh, when two boys were crossing, they were doing some repair and the Japanese engineer was told, okay, remove the soil on both sides. And that high-handed engineer, that's why as I say, you know, when you're doing value engineering, you have to be very careful. Without listening to all this, he removed this, all this soil. He did not understand the arch theory. So, and in that night, it rained a lot. And the boys are, two boys are crossing. And, you know, this is a classic way of dying. So one boy walked past the other boy was having a phone. He got a phone call. He stopped to answer the phone. And this boy kept on going. And as soon as he reaches here, he is, this guy is here, this collapsed. Because soil has been made saturated by the rain. And soil weight becomes too much. Soil became weak. The C and phi parameters were changed due to the presence of uh, water. And soil lost strength. Too much weight came onto these very weak, thin shell type structures. And it all collapsed. And the boy was killed. Unfortunately, he was killed. And then the villagers who were very angry with STDP started writing. Writing. So it was like another Aragale there. They would start writing. Then the government thought, okay, we are not going to go any further with this project. We need a presidential commission so that, you know, you, they can divert the attention. And then I was appointed as the chairman of this one. And we started investigating. And the coordinating engineer was engineer Chandrasi. So coordinating engineer was Mr. Chandrasi. And then what happened was, Mr. Chandrasi gave me all the, the files that he had in 1997-1998 on these structures. And I started investigating, but I had no idea about these structures because I have never seen such structures because I never considered they are suitable for any expressway project, not even a highway I would consider. Because they were they were made for America where the labor is so expensive and uh, so steel structures were actually meant for American market where the labor is very expensive. So if the labor is very expensive, constructing a structure like this by filling up with soil is very cheap. Very, very cost effective. So it was a structure meant for uh, America. And then uh, there's some uh, H-beam. And there were a lot of cracks in H-beams. So this, uh, I mean, the moment you look at these structures, you can see they are very poorly constructed structures. So, uh, so there were a lot of criticism about those structures. And uh, I found that there is a blunder. What is the blunder? There's a theory that says the minimum cover is 600 millimeters if rigid permit. Payment is rigid. If the payment is flexible, you have this 600 plus the thickness of the flexible payment, which is about 600, another 600 millimeters. Because in a flexible payment, you get base courses, then ABC. Then uh, premix and then the wearing course. 
So all together will be about 600 millimeters. And then you need to have another 600 millimeters of soil. Now, suddenly we found that, you know, the designs are wrong. Designs are wrong. So here for the, for the major STDP project, designs are wrong. What will happen? So if they are wrong, you have to correct it. So the correction is have a concrete line and make it a concrete arch. Forget about the, this. And we try to get it done by the contractor, but contractor quoted very huge prices. So we found that it's not possible to get it done from the contractor. So at the Department of Civil Engineering, University of Marathua, we design all these shells that all the details are, all the reports are available. I think about 80 reports we did. And all for every structure, we did a report with a complete finite element analysis. Using, we those days we use SAP because we were actually looking at the equilibrium condition, which is, although SAP is not strictly applicable to the behavior of soil, we were actually looking at the, the concrete part, not the soil behavior, but we were looking, just looking at the forces and what the forces that will act on concrete. So, so the use of the SAP 2000 for that type of analysis can be justified. So when you are, the other thing that you have to understand is, the soil behavior has, must be represented by a soil, soil software and don't do SAP 2000 if you are trying to model soil. If you are going to find the deformation of short-term deformation, short-term deformation of soil, yes, SAP 2000 can do that. But if you are, if you are going to find the long-term, the real soil behavior, you must go to a geotechnical input. So my favorite is Dr. Nalini De Silva. The reason is I know he, he knows the theory. There are many others who pretend that they know the theory, but uh, when you go to them, you, you don't get a good, good service because they don't know. And his number is not 7554949. So I trust him because he knows the theory. So basically it's so important that, you know, you must know what the theory you need for analysis. If you don't know the theory and then use some software, you will get answers. So we say garbage in to the computer and what do you get? Garbage out. So you make a raw model, analyze, and then the wrong answers, you design, and then the factor of safety can become less than one. One day it collapses, kill people, kill people. As it happened in Miami, uh, about one year ago, one, about one year ago, I think, uh, in Miami, uh, one building collapsed, about 15 story building. And uh, that was because uh, the design engineers have under-designed the, under the transfer plate. Transfer plate. Because when you under design the trans, it's so easy to under design a trans plate. Because if you just consider it as a just a plate, then you can under design it. But if you consider that it's a plate loaded with incremental loading, then you will find the bending moments can increase by about thirty percent, whereas shear forces can increase by about ten percent. So if you don't know that theory, then you can easily make a big blunder. And my rule of thumb is. When you increase the bending moment by 50%, increase the shear force by 25%. Why? It's such an important structure. If you provide little more reinforcement in a transfer plate, it's no problem because transfer plate, if it is good, if it is having a factor of safety of three, then the usual factor of two or 2.5. Because when you design a concrete structure, the normal factor of safety is two to 2.5. That means you can overload it by 20 to uh, around about 100% overloading can, can be taken up by the structure before it uh, reaches ultimate limit state. Whereas uh, <clears throat> I would like it to be about 200% uh, overloading for a transfer plate because transfer plate is a key member. So when you are doing structure designs, you must understand 
there are some members that are considered as key members and a failure of a key member is a killer can kill you can kill people so key members must be over designed it's not a crime to over design a key member because it's a crime to design the key member because if you design the key member there's a chance one day key member might fail lead into a catastrophic failure of the structure whereas if you over design the key member there's absolutely no chance of any catastrophe like that happening because key member lifespan will be much longer than the lifespan of the building so the key member will hold the building whereas many others may have many durability problems and repairs may be affected but uh, the 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 key member or the trans plate might stay without any problem so you have to actually get that right okay so uh, then uh, there was a query and then we found a lot of problems so we we suggested this still uh, unfortunately if, if there are engineers from rda they should look into this matter because it, and because we gain about 5 billion rupees from this stdp project now i think it may be about 6 billion rupees income per year and we need if we do 1 billion rupee worth of repair every year after a 6 to 7 years you find all these uh, uh, structures can be repaired because uh, just uh, it's just a uh, pumping concrete with some reinforcement and forming a forming a uh, skin which he can act as an arch for this box for this gut so basically it's something that should be done because it's a design fault design fault so when you have a design fault you have to one edge other correct it but unfortunately in our southern highway it has it is yet to be corrected from kurunduga hatamme to map so though we are talking big about our highway it's it is seven design faults from kurunduga uh, hatamme to mathur especially with these soil style structures so uh, so after that we opened the highway in november 2011 and uh, about around that time we, the government of sri lanka decided okay It is wonderful to have a highway up to Gaul, but to get the real benefit, it can, should go up to Mathura, right? So it should go up to Mathura. So uh, a fresh contract was given to a Chinese company, not very professional, but uh, you know they don't have proper proper manpower and work work ethics. But uh, the consultant was uh, Miss the. the the top man was mr the engineer mbs fernando and he was the first uh, chairman of uh, i think he was a chairman yes chairman of uh, of uh, road development authority he was the first chairman of road development authority he actually came from highways department many engineers did not come to road development authority from highways yes department but later they were forced to come by that time they came the first people who first went were very senior and they were the general managers and chairman of rda so that's what happened and this change happened in 1980 quite first january 1985 rda was created and before that it was the highways highway department highway department it was a highway department so i went to for training in uh, november 1985 84 we went for the training at highways department and and by the time we finished our training in january 1985 uh, november december maybe december maybe december so december This early December, and when we finished our training, uh, somewhere around uh, February, about uh, we had only about uh, ten ten uh, weeks of training. Uh, somewhere in February nineteen eighty five, 
we were we were actually theoretically we were attached to highways but we should have been attached to road development authority because uh, highways department and road development authority existed side by side for a while and after that gradually government made sure highways department becomes nobody and road development authority becomes the authority so it took about one year and uh, then uh, so uh, so basically miss mb was there chandrasekhar himal chandrasekhar was the coordinating the project director appointed by the ministry of highways uh, on secondment from uh, road development authority and he's a superb uh, clients project manager and when you are clients project manager in a design and build project how do you avoid claims in a project now the most important thing is avoid claims because you have told everything you want to tell you basically when the contractor is preparing the documents you have to make sure 100% of the things you want are clearly said so that the if there's anything that the contractor does not provide you for the stipulated price then you can force the contractor to fulfill it because in the original document you have included all these requirements the original requirement they have used for bidding has all the requirements and because of that reason you can uh, the you can claim the ask the contractor to do it but contractor cannot submit it so that is one of the more very important project management principles so how you avoid uh, turnkey projects or design and build projects design and build projects how we avoid claims is do not tell the contractor what to do to once start once start if you tell anything contractor will happily say yes so we we'll do that no problem but after about two months now you find for something that you would have cost 10 million contract is claiming 50 million rupees so now you are in a fix because contractors you have asked the contractor to go ahead without knowing how much he is going to claim and because of that reason contractors properly done the job that you ask the contractor to do but now you are expecting the contractor to ask for 10 million contractor is asking for 50 million rupees so you are in a fix so the theory is you must project prepare the project brief taking sufficient time so that and it, it should be done by a proper expert hire a proper expert and get it done so that contractor can be left alone then you'll ask what what the hell these clients engineers are doing are they have ready of work so the current the contractor submit bills they have to check the bills they have to they have to check everything so basically uh, the clients engineer has to do a lot of work and that is mainly on checking but if you see some mistake some omission so that means your original document has it but contract has not done it the original document has the task but original contract has not done now suddenly you become a king and you what you do is you file a letter to consultant and don't do it if the is a consultant does not take proper action you can raise it at monthly meeting monthly meeting you will ask ask why the contractor uh, why the uh, you know we have show, shown a shortcoming that we thought as a shortcoming we really don't know if this is a shortcoming or whatever it is we showed that you know there is something in uh, some disparity that we have observed because when uh, when we carefully looked at this particular set of documents uh, that is actually used as the original uh, set of documents we can clearly see you have omitted so the theory is keep your mouth shut 
mouth shut but be a spy and find what contractor did not do but in the original document you may don't want work on your mind the requirements if something is not included in the original document you cannot ask for it never ask for it from the uh, contractor if the moment you ask for it the contractor will submit a claim so you must be very careful in project management project management is a art and our engineer transfer you did it so well and you won't believe this 36 kilometers from goal to marker and you will ask what is the distance on our normal road normal road is 28 miles and you can convert 28 miles to kilometers and goal marker is 28 miles into 1.6 marker is 100 kilometers 100 miles goal is 72 miles so it's 28 km miles so 44.8 kilometers and you can see southern highway because it goes inside inside the country it goes inside and also it's a straight road not a winding road the the normal highway has 44.8 kilometers whereas the length of the super expressway is 36 kilometers and you won't believe this 36 kilometers be widened for 4000 million rupees so this is the embankment so we made it slightly wider we we did not have to cut any hills because the when rda the when the contract the original contract if you are cutting a hill you cut for six lanes because one day this highway will be a six lane highway so provision is there for this to be a six lane highway so southern highway can be a six lane highway one day if the demand is so so much because at the moment there is no demand so for that kind of expansion but had it been uh, the previous government that was there before 2014 end of 2014 they would have actually widened the southern highway to be a six lane road uh, as well so because they were so fond of doing things that we really don't know it. so basically this is a project that started uh, in 2000 in 1999 under the chandika uh, bandana kumarathunga awarded under ayil vikramasinghe's time but still she was the president and then uh, then uh, they found that it is not happening when mahindra rajapaksha was the president and then uh, you know we actually did lot of work to rectify this and then uh, you know so our department of civil engineering two more prof one more professor was one another professor was asked to find whether it's really def but def and the report came as inconclusive so they did not know whether it's def or not so then what it sort of was okay so whether it's def or not we have repaired it so we had a big fight with uh, the consultants that they hired from uk and so we we actually sorted it out so basically you can see now if you are doing for value engineering you must be very careful about def and you must be very careful about concrete strength whether you use pt and whether you have provide the minimum reinforcement that's another has here as well because concrete we had to provide minimum reinforcement when you are doing a bridge so so in 2010 mr nimal chand engineer nimal chand siri was made the project director and during that time the, there was a change in the ministry so admiral vasanta karana got became the uh, secretary of the ministry and he did a very good service he was very friendly with us and we we all worked so there was a team mtrj uh, vasantakarana got bvd and chandasiri so that was the main team 
you know because we had to clear the blunders and blunders are design blunders blunders and quality control in blunders that is uh, not taking enough precautions to prevent the EF. So there were so many blunders in this project. And, and we, we went, the, by the time we stepped in, all the blunders have already done by inexperienced engineers who did not know that they don't know. So it's very important when you are doing value engineering, you must know the subject well and also know what you don't know. Do not know. That is also very important. If you don't know anything, so for example, if I have to do a geotechnical design, I will not do it. I will ask Dr. Narendra Siddhartha to use MIDAS GTX or MIDAS Soilworks and ask him to uh, ask Dr. Narendra Siddhartha to He's a young guy. He passed out in, uh, not very young, but he's very experienced. He, he has MSc, PhD, and working experience in UK, UK experience, working experience. So, and he's a real brain, and he's a master of the game. And I think he gets up early, early in the morning and work. That's why he's such a good brain, because uh, when you get up early in the morning, it works. So you must know, that means you must read euro codes and you must read it fully right. so that is the way that you do value engineering so you must learn every bit of euro code and but euro code is a very complicated document so what i do is when i read i convert it to a simple rule that i can remember the the real domain can be like this but you'll find if you know this part of the knowledge then you can make correct decisions so what i do is by reading all these things i eliminate all the unnecessary things and i select this part of the knowledge and then what i do is i convert it to simple rules so if you ask me to do a highway design i need minimum reference of Eurocode to two. That is the DC highway. Why? The reason is I have already stored almost all the rules that you have to know in the brain. So it's very important if you are going to be a value engineer, you have to work hard. You cannot be a value engineer based on experience because Valuing is an art that must be learned by the engineer by improving the knowledge to the level that the engineer can almost do a design without looking at a code. So that's the level of knowledge you need to have. Now you know the problem. Problem, no materials, expensive materials, there's a need to minimize the use of materials. Why? If the material content is minimized, then the cost goes down. Why? Automatically, you are using less material. So, so how do we use less material? How we use less material is we go for high strength concrete. Because the, the beauty of Euro ports is they allow you to use uh, concrete cube strengths from 30 up to uh, 105. The cube strength can vary between preferably 30 to 105. So that is the condition that is. Ours. Whereas in uh, Euro BS codes, generally, you know, we go for something like 30 to uh, 25 to 50. So our range is about 25 to 50, madam. Whereas when you are using Euro codes, you can go from 30 to 105. Now let's see 
What are the advantages we can gain by going for high strength concrete? So to do that, we are going to look at an example again. So this is one possible solution. And I got us is one possible solution. So that's one possible solution you have thought because you are a traditional thing. Then I come in, I say, okay, I'm going to do it different. I'm going to do this. And I'm going to have this. And I'm going to have two, four large piles, four numbers of large piles. I'm not going to have a lot of piles and huge thing, but I'm going to cantilever this about six meters. How do you have a cantilever of six meters? That is not easy because you have to have some reinforcement going like that and some other reinforcement going like that. And this is called two stage pre-stressing because, and then rather than have so many beams, I'm going to have three beams. And this is 18.2 meters wide. So I'll have three, three beams. And the wearing course, and I'll have bearings. Okay. Now, which one will cost less, cost more? So this may have 18 meters, means you, this may have about 10 I beams. That means it's going to have about 10 waves. 10 waves. 10 I beams, 10 waves. How many waves that I have here? I have only six waves. This might need about 10 piles because you have to support it every. I'm using only four piles. And here you have huge quantity of reinforcement going in. Yeah, I have a very narrow thing, which is only about 4.5 meters. So I need less concrete. And, and then I also need less concrete and I need uh, less uh, steel because, you know, concrete, when you put concrete, you have to put a put lot of steel. So basically, now you can see how I'm thinking about it. And so I might have about 30 40%. But my, my intention is to go for 50, 50, 50% or even more. Then I might do another design. What is that? I might go for a cellular raft. Cellular raft. So I remove a lot of soil. Because about three meters below, I have found that around five meters below, the soil is good. It's lateral. So if it's a lateral soil, why do you need a pile for me? Where the pile goes up to 30 meters. You don't need it. I'm going to go for a cellular. And I will make it very, uh, the soil weight replaced by the raft, cellular raft, is equal to the total weight of the beach, then what will happen? Will the soil know that, you know, something has happened? No, because earlier soil was support. Lighter. And then I'm going to have a beach on top of that. And in that bridge also, rather than having a lot of priest, a lot of reinforcement, I'm going to use 60 megapascal concrete and make, put some vertical, vertical priestess. So what will happen when you put lot of, some vertical priestess? What will happen? So what happens is, What happens is when you have high strength concrete and put a lot of little bit of pre-stress, what will happen? 
when this core tried to go this way, it, anyway it's carrying a lot of compression. And if a bending moment comes, this will become active, this will not be active. That's huge strength. And because it's, it is pre stressed this way, is there any chance that it will crack like this? No, it will not crack like that. So what you do is, you know, you'll provide a very minimum amount of reinforcement. And also, sometimes you might consider that, you know, if you need a white, you know, you go for a white grappling beam, white, white, white one, where you can make even the center part hollow. What is that advantage? Because this is having 1,200 width. So what do you have when you need less reinforcement? That's one. Because you have a high strength concrete, so you might use 10 millimeter reinforcement just to control the cracks. Because you know concrete cracks, so you have to prevent cracking. So you provide little reinforcement. Is there any chance of DEF here? You cannot try DEF in here. So you don't get DEF. Because you know it's a big pore, then you can get DEF. Now you are not getting DEF. So that means everything you save. Everything that you can think of saving, save, save, save. And then because now we have not gone for pi foundation, we are going for a hollow core, hollow pier, and then we are having a solid uh, pier capping beam, and pier capping beam has, has a very narrow uh, support, and pier capping beam is relying fully on uh, pre stressing. Itself. Because it's because it's relying on pre stressing, it's very much worthwhile having some pre stress there because. We, we can put create very unbalanced situations during the construction. So you go for that. So basically, you will use very high strength concrete that will allow compression members to be PT, apply PT. So basically, you are having a member in compression, member in compression, you are applying PT at the two corners. What did happen? But you have some reinforcement there, very light reinforced. You don't need reinforcement because PT has so much capacity. Whenever something happens, PT will make sure the structure is brought back to its original position, unless you have permanent deformation, which is very unlikely. So what you do is you will go for PT, high strength concrete. Why? Because the Eurocode allow you to go for 0.6 FCK. And the FCK is the cube, sorry, cylinder strength. Cylinder strength. The FCK is the cylinder strength. For example, when the cube strength is, the cylinder strength is 25, cube is 30. The cube is 30. Uh, because cube, cube always uh, shows about 25% extra strength. The strength you will see in a cube is not there. It is a, just an arbitrary uh, thing and uh, it's not there. It is actually the cylinder strength is the accurate strength, whereas uh, cube strength is not accurate. It's showing a higher strength than the normal strength. So you must know all these things. Then you can easily go. Now, now you can see, after explaining all those unnecessary things, where I told you so many things, suddenly I have shown you how to optimize because uh, now I'm going thinking about 60 to 80 megapascal concrete. Then you'll ask, how on earth you get 80 megapascal? And I did not say I'm going to get 80 megapascal in 28 days. I will try and get about 50 megapascal in 28 days. And then what I do is I will use fry ash 50 to 55 megapascal. And I will, I will can have a strength development curve like this, which is a gradual one, but continuing. And if I don't use fly ash in today's cement, it will go like this. So this is without fly ash with today's cement. And what is the difference between today's cement and the earlier cements? So this is 40 years ago. And today, uh, so we have the main item, titanium silicate. 40 years ago, it's 50. Now it's 64. 
Dicassian silicate, which is uh, responsible for stem development from 14 days until infinity. Those days we had 25%, now we have 5%. And C3S, C3A content and tricassium aluminate content was used to be 8%. Today also 8% because if you mess up with that, your concrete can uh, crack later. And then uh, C4 aluminum ferrites, it's about 10% even today. C4 aluminum ferrites remain as 10. So basically, uh, you can see cement is different. So, so the only way, now this is one to 14 days. So this is very hard to make sure the strength gains after 14 days because this is only 5%. So what you do is when you get concrete cement, so if you want 300 kilograms of cement, you go for 260 kilograms of cement and 40 kilograms of fudge. You go for 40 kilograms of fudge. So the moment you go for 40 kilograms of pi ash, now you have a cement which is capable of doing this. It is capable of doing, capable of doing this. Whereas if you use 300 kilograms, then it is capable of doing only this. If I'm having a cement that is capable of going on this, if I have at least 55 megapascal in 28 days, in about one year, what will happen? I will have 80 megapascal. So how long will you need to construct, complete the bridge? Because let's say it's, a, it's about 40 meters spans, 10 spans. The long bridge, big bridge. So it needs about one year to complete. So if you are getting this high strength in one year's time, it's perfectly okay. Perfectly okay. So what we do is we go for some logical thinking based designs where where we know we start stretching the clauses given in the code to the very limit because zero code never asks you to rely on 28 day strength as in the British code. So you can see, you can both for strengths which are achieved a much later date, but still uh, you can uh, design, when you are designing uh, the transfer state, transfer, 40 megapascal. Service, 80 megapascal. So no problem. The transfer is not very important because uh, the transfer stresses may not be that critical. Whereas what is more, most critical may be the durability. Concepts. Durability. Because you are using very high strength concrete, the code might allow you to use a smaller cover. And when you use the smaller cover, you can reduce the concrete. Because you are using smaller cover, so your concrete quantity will come down. So when you do all these things, you might hit something like 55 to 60% saving. And we call it value engineering because a road can cost about uh, 2 million US dollars per kilometer, 20, 20. A road, an elevated highway can cost 20 million US dollars per kilometer. Is it 20? We, uh, yes, moment, 20 into uh, three, 20 million into uh, 360. And uh, yes, it's about 7.2 billion rupees. Yes, 7.2, yes. This is a correct figure. The, the elevated highway can cost about 20 million rupees per, per kilometer. And then what you do is, if it is three kilometers of highway, uh, you cannot uh, actually charge for everything because uh, sometimes you are repeating, but if that have been different spans, different things, then you have to have different designs. So let's assume that uh, 
the total length is uh, total cost is 60 million US dollars. And you bring it down to about 25 million US dollars, 28 million US dollars. And then you are saving 22 million US dollars. 22 million US dollars, where 2.2 million US dollars will be yours. Because uh, generally, when you do value engineering, we cannot go up to about 30%, but in Sri Lanka, I mean, um, we, uh, we have been doing a lot of work, and generally, we have maintained something like 10% to make it very attractive for uh, the, the engineers. Because you will find that even this 2.2 million US dollars means 2.2 into uh, uh, 2.2 million into 360. That alone is 792 million. So you can see by designing, by going for a value engineering solution, you can charge 792 million rupees. But whereas, had you gone for uh, design, engineer will be paid 1% of it. That is 60 million, 1% means 0.6 million US dollars. So something that you can get only get only 0.6 million US dollars, because you have done a poor design, I come up and say, I can do a good design. And you, as the original design engineer, gets 0.6 million rupees, and I get 2.2 million US dollars. Oh, I get 792 million rupees, whereas as the design engineer, you will be paid only uh, 200 million. About 200 million, you, you will be paid because uh, this is the you know, your technical input, a structural input, or the drawings, and then, you know, the, the drainage aspect. So every aspect, lighting, drainage, everything will be in that 216 million. Whereas I keep everything intact, but I change only the structure, structure and I earn 2.2 million US dollars. Whereas, uh, you know, uh, as the design engineer, you are paid only 0.6 million US dollars to undertake everything, including the site investigation. So you can see suddenly, you know, you are not doing damn well. And because your design is poor, has room for improvement. I step in and I earn a lot of money. So what I have shown you is how to do that. And I, I, I like you doing that because I like you to do a good value engineers for the world. You know, forget about Sri Lanka because Sri Lanka is not very important market for you. And you can go for the real market and that is the international market. And to go for international market, the important thing is, First important thing, getting up at 4 p.m., 4 a.m., and to sleep 9 a.m., 9 p.m., or 10 p.m. Because uh, if, um, as you are getting mature, you can actually uh, sleep less, especially when you are doing good exercises, and uh, four kilometer walk, and uh, cycling 30 minutes or yoga, and if you are interested in yoga, uh, you know, you can actually uh, try and learn it properly. And uh, it's very important that you learn it properly because uh, if you don't learn it properly, uh, you can make very big mistakes. And, uh, and those mistakes can cause various injuries. So if you are doing it, do it properly. Otherwise, don't do it at all. So one of the good teachers is... Uh, Um, this is Mala Veragoda. And her number is 22273138. She's very good in teaching. Then number three, food intake, 2000 calories per day. Calories per day, why? Then your brain is, brain is super. Not only in the morning, but even during the daytime, it works well. And number four, uh, 
look for new technology and that is eurocodes so you must learn eurocodes and create your own your own methods to recall what is said in the euro so you must learn uh, ec6 that is uh, ec7 that is uh, earthquake code uh, ec6 that is the uh, foundation code is ec5 is uh, masonry code masonry ec7 yes. and uh, we have again uh, ec2 2.1 and 2.2 both all these codes must be pretty familiar with you so the only way you can do that is get up at 4 o'clock and start working because when the the theory is anything that you do when your stomach is empty can be recalled easily anything that you do when your stomach is full you cannot recall it and one of the key things is reduce sugar intake because sugar intake can affect you in various ways so we are reduce the sugar intake so the idea is learn to drink to drink plain cold tea plain tea but cold that means not warm just you know lukewarm or no temperature at all learn to drink and this is what chinese do it will do two things one is no milk no in, no any kind of milk and if you want to drink milk drink uh, have a yogurt or cheese or butter but uh, don't have margarine because that is poison so basically again don't have butter that is made out of palm oil go for real butter the local butter so chinese they drink lot of tea plain tea or green tea but they smoke but no cancer why because all these uh, cancer cells will be destroyed in their body by this tea and tea has little bit of kick so your brain will work well because it can it has little kind of uh, uh, small kick is there so your brain will be very functional then then you can do value engineering design. because you can see value engineering design is a very simple thing where we look at minimizing the amount of material by going for cellular rafts instead of uh, pile foundations but if the soil is very weak over 20 meters then we will we'll go for pile foundation but if they have laterite soil about 3 4 meters below then you will go for cellular raft foundation and then uh, we can think about pt and then you know pt here and then you know if you can manage the whole bridge with uh, two two box girders is even better but when the bridges are very wide then then you might have to go for cellular box girders so cellular box girder is a miss uh, it's not a good concept because very difficult to construct it So if you are going for box girders, then it's better to go for three box girders than two box girders as being said. For that, you must read books, and you must read the book by Hamley, Professor Hamley. Professor Hamley has written a ni- very nice book, and you must read the book by Professor. Hamley. and he died in 1995 he came to our university in 1994 and perad the year november 1994 but unfortunately he is a super engineer but he died very young from the like 60 62 i think maybe he is not that tall he died uh, in 1994 but he is a super engineer he has a book called bridge deck analysis bridge deck analysis you might not understand most of the mathematics he is trying to tell you because he is a mathematics guy who developed theoretical solutions for many things today we can do with finite element 
not me. So it's very important. If you want to be a good value engineer, you must become a master of MIDAS sim. MIDAS civil because all your analysis will be based on MIDAS civil. Because in a highway, we get lorries crossing the bridge, crossing the bridge. So we need a bending moment in lock to do the distance. And one way or the other, you have to generate a bending moment in lock and a shear force in lock. That develop these two. The moment you do these two, and also torsional moments, if applicable, torsional moments if applicable. So with all this, you can start. Then you will go for a grill edge analysis. And once you model it as a grill edge, you can easily get this. these diagrams and the torsional moment diagrams all can be obtained. And once you get the moments, bending moments, shear forces, and you know PT designs, how to do a PT design, is simply supported or continuous. There are different theories and different set of equations. And basically, even simply supported one, you can use the same equation, but people sometimes use different, different equations. And all that part shall be done. Then, then basically, you can come up with a good solution where you go for uh, the high strain concrete. And then you'll ask, you did not explain us how to get the high strain concrete. In concrete, we have cement, and we can have fly ash, which can, I prefer going up to about 15% uh, fry ash to be around 15%. Then you have sand, aggregate, and water. And when you have no, no admixture, it can be 200 kilograms with uh, re reasonably good water reducing admixture, 180. When you go for a super plus size, it can go up to about 150. And it can be about 150. And it can even go down to about 100. So based on this, you can decide how much cement you need, right? So basically, start it. So I told the rule generally, uh, if you want 30 megapascal concrete, and you are going to, you are not going to do anything to 10, divided by 10 plus 50 kilograms of cement, and out of that 350, you can say, I'm going to use 300 kilograms of cement and 50 kilograms of light. That is very much. Now you find you are going to use some of these admixtures and you are going to use, uh, instead of, if, if you use 200 kilograms of water, 200 uh, divided by 350, the answer is 200 divided by 350, the answer is 0.57 water cement is. And now you decide to use 150 kilograms of water, then 150 divided by 350. You will find now the water cement ratio has come down to 0.42 or 3. Then you might find, okay, why do we need 350? Well, can't we go for 330? So you try a mix with 330, right? So when you go, is this 330, then the, then the water cement ratio is 0.45. Now you can see who is actually, what, who is the killer? This is the killer, water. So if you want to get high strength concrete, use less, less, less water. But there's a problem because we made concrete at the Beckham plant at Calonia. We want to use it in Save Island. And we need two hours of traveling because there can be traffic. So what did happen? We have to add a lot of admixture. We have to maintain a sump of 200 millimeters initially. 
to get the a size specified sump of 220 millimeters that you need for pump. Whereas my theory is don't do that. You go for site mix. Mix concrete at site with uh, where you can mix one meter cube of concrete using a pan mixer. And you will ask why I advocate it. That's how we actually constructed bridges in the about uh, 30, 40 to 50 years ago. We did the bridges without ready mix concrete. And we use pan mixers at the site. We use admixtures. We reduce the cement content to such an extent, sorry, water content to such an extent that we could reduce the cement content as well. And then what we did was uh, we maintain very low water cement ratios like 0.4 water cement ratio, or even less. The moment you reduce the water, one, one way or the other, vibrate the concrete, then you get super high strength concrete that gains the strength very easily. So, so what you do is the trick is use that mixture, reduce the reduce the water content and the strength does not depend on sand and aggregate. It depends on cement, it depends on water. Cement can be high if you want high strength. Water has to be as low as possible if you want high strength. These two can be anything that you, but make sure you use uh, for aggregates. Sand, you use quarry dust. Manufactured sand. Then uh, six millimeter chips. Then 10 millimeter aggregates, 20 millimeter aggregates. So what do you get? You get a mix that can be compacted very well. And because the mix can be compacted very well, what can you say about the strength? Strength will be super, super strength. So you might get 55 megapascal in 28 days. When you do this with minimum water, when you use 350 kilograms per meter cube. Can you just, have you ever heard a 55 megapascal concrete obtained by using 350 kilograms of per meter cube of cement and a water cement, water content of 138? Somewhere like that. And you'd ask, how did you hit 138? Because I mixed the concrete at site. I don't need huge margins on uh, on on uh, slump, so I I know what it is. I just by looking at the concrete, I can say whether I can co compact it or not. So I don't need batching plants. I will do the manufacturing because these days labor is cheap. Labor rate is about four thousand rupees per day. It's still cheaper to do it manually than. Uh, using vehicles because the diesel cost is 500 rupees per liter. It's about 500 rupees per liter, so it's no point in doing anything using machinery, always use labor and go for optimization. Then you can actually get many things right. So that is the trick of value engineering. So value engineering means high strength concrete, high strength concrete with very low water content, and reasonable cement, because cement is very expensive. So don't overuse cement, use the minimum cement to get the correct strength, but look at the durability aspects. Because when the cement content is very low, what are the chances of DEF? No problem with DEF, because DEF cannot, can occur when, only when the cement content, not the, not the cementitious content, when the cement content is 275, very little DEF, when the, Cement conductor of 300 or so, very low chance of getting. So the moment you know these, these data and all these data, how do you find it? And you can type MTR casing uh, DEF and you can download the paper, research paper that you have published in ISL. We could have published that paper internationally, but we published it locally because we want to help you. So basically, uh, you know, the concept is Go for high strength, go for pre-stress, uh, try and you know, try and avoid unnecessary foundations, 
uh, work with the geotechnical engineer because they are very if you get all of a super geotechnical engineer like dr nain disabla you can do wonders because he understands he can answer every geotechnical question that comes to your mind so you go for go with the top people because value engineering cannot be done by an average engineer value engineering can be done only by a top engineer who has vast knowledge so that's why i i spend some time you know uh, you know explaining things that may not look like relevant to this lecture but why i explain southern highway is it's very important for you to understand if you are a value engineer don't do drastic changes change gradually so that and you change gradually and during that time you don't worry about the fee but you worry about your experience and the moment you gain more and more experience you will go for uh, super things that are very different with that are based on completely out of box thing so that's the way the future and make sure whether you are successful in aragale or not on ninth one thing is the future will be very bright will be very bright provided that we have honest leaders and the, that is the requirement so the moment you get it sorted out we don't have to worry about this country because we are not going to solve this country's problems once you master all these things you can go for you can link up with these chinese companies because uh, they are they are very fond of our engineers so link up with these chinese companies doing lot of work in africa africa and uh, you can do lot of these kind of con design contracts because your knowledge is super and you can even uh, become project managers in africa for chinese projects because the chinese don't know this kind of art of doing things they are just doing in the traditional way so the moment you go for this there's a goal mind goal mind waiting for you and what i tell all my students is tap this goal mind by they do mbsc then they do msc and then they go for phd and our target is in 20 years you are the ceo of a big company in us that's our target. so so we work with the vision and to work with the vision the most important thing is don't jump into the first jump because somebody has said something always analyze the problem identify the problem and once you analyze then you identify then then uh, have some rational thinking and out of box thinking and plan the solution very well once you do all these things then you can come up with better solutions and innovative solutions and always look out for things that you can see on internet of the very special solutions people have done and try to appreciate try to understand why they have done it that way and the moment you start doing those things uh, you know you can get rid of the rust in your brain because most of you have not used the brains properly since you passed out because most of the time you try to take this way out and the easy way out is a difficult thing. and with that i'll uh, end the lecture inira kamala yeah thank you yeah thank you very much for the exciting almost to uh, two two and two hours, half. yeah to more than two hours yeah but 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 you, you should know yeah, I, thank I you know thank you so much uh, being yeah, a for this for, uh, information it's all yeah. you know, I, i had everything stored in my brain it's actually it's a great that uh, this i opening steps take yeah, so. uh, to do this lecture as value engineering for highway structures actually this has to be applicable for i think almost all the engineering aspects as engineers and decision makers i think we have to give the attention for this so thank you so much for this uh, yeah, okay thank you very much yeah also i thank kisl secretariat and it team and this publicity department taking the steps to publicize the event and for hosting arrangements 
last but actually not least, I thank you all for your active participation and have a wonderful evening to all of you. A very good night. Good night, Professor and everybody. <laughs>